want to go through a few scriptures with you as we go along, as we go through the book of Luke. And the fact that uh, Luke is telling us about Jesus walking on earth with us. And we'll be in Luke chapter 22 for most of the, uh, this evening. And I'd like to lead us up to the time in which that Jesus and his disciples took the communion. Remember when he went into Jerusalem, there was a great crowd that followed him. There was a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm. And now we're seeing in just a couple of days that this enthusiasm is beginning to wane, uh, not so much amongst the, the, how should I say, not so much, uh, mainly uh, it's because of the, the work that the Pharisees are trying to do in promoting and uh, pushing for the demise of Jesus. The first verse in chapter 22 says this, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. The reason they're saying that is because at the end of the previous chapter 21, uh, the Bible tells us then that Jesus was daily in the temple. The people were around him. It says that, that uh, every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged on the mount called Olivet. And early in the morning, all the people came to him and, the, and it came to the temple to hear him. And now we're seeing that, that uh, the Pharisees are facing a timeline. With this, with this feast that's coming to Passover, there's, there's a whole lot of people that are going to come crowding into Jerusalem. And they understand that the power and the strength that the people have in supporting Jesus. So they're under this timeline as with the approach of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, in order that they get rid of this Jesus character before the crowds get to be too big. I think they're a bit concerned. But what happens is a, um, they have a stroke of good fortune, if you can call it that. Because one of Jesus' own disciples comes to them. His name is Judas. The Bible tells us in, ch in uh, chapter 22, verse 3, then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. In the absence of a crowd. They're looking for an opportune, opportunity to be able to uh, take Jesus away without inciting the crowd. They needed an insider to know where Jesus was going to be. An interesting thing that I had never thought about before is this. And, and that is, we might think that Judas was not a part of the plan. He absolutely was. Think what would have happened if... They didn't have someone like Judas to be able to betray Jesus. Think what would have happened if, in the midst of the great crowds that had gathered there, they tried to arrest Jesus and tried to take him away, what might have happened? There could have been a huge riot take place. There could have been massive bloodshed. And, and I hadn't thought about this, but uh, and in, in, trying to, in trying to put ourselves into Jesus' position and follow his mindset, he understands that oftentimes when the leader of a movement is taken out, so are the followers. And so Jesus wants to be very careful that he is the only one then that's going to have his blood shed for this movement. It's very, very important to Jesus that his disciples then should be allowed to carry on, should, be, should not be involved in his arrest and in his murder, in his crucifixion. And that, that Judas should be a part of that, then he's the one who betrays Jesus, goes and says to them that, they're, that, he is go, that he will tell them where Jesus is going to be. So Jesus immediately then goes out and begins, uh, and Judas immediately goes out and then is... Um, furtively keeping track of where Jesus is and letting the Pharisees know about what's going to happen. 
Uh, the next portion of this story comes to us again in the following verses of chapter 22. And here's where we read about the, the, the Passover with the disciples. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, Behold, when you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he, and he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. They went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Again, I want to mention to you that there's, there's prior preparation to this. Jesus has been in Jerusalem before. I, and, and it's interesting. What we're told here is basically just some, some facts we're not told any of the surrounding story behind it. For example, uh, this one who says to Jesus, yes, uh, you, can, you can use my place. I imagine it like this. The Bible doesn't tell us. This is just my imagination. This is the Bible according to David Homer for just a moment. And, uh, and, I'm, I'm, and, and, you know, sometimes it's okay to take a little bit of liberty like this. I'm imagining that suppose Jesus is, a, is in Jerusalem. He's been in Jerusalem before. And someone who's a follower of his and, and one who has believed in him and says, Jesus is the Messiah, comes, to up, comes up to Jesus and says, by the way, next time you're in Jerusalem, I have a room where you could meet with your disciples. And so then this is the time. And Jesus, you know, they don't have telephones and, and Internet and that kind of thing to find out where this guy is located. And so Jesus may have asked him, well, how can I get in contact with him? And he may have said, it's very easy. I have a man slave who collects water every day. All you need to do is follow the man slave carrying the water to my place. Because in, the, in that time, ladies, you got the water. You collected the water. It was very rarely seen that men would be around the well collecting the water. And, and uh, in this particular instance, uh, here's this man slave that would collect the water for the and, and again, I was thinking, um, th this, this person who's collecting probably wasn't a Jew. And for all we know, we, we have no idea about him, but I'm thinking, why is there this man carrying the water when typically it's a job for the women to do? And maybe he's someone who was unable to get a job anywhere else, and so this man has taken it. My, my point is this. There, there's so much that's said into the Bible that's not give, we're not given any details about. It's just told to us. And uh, there's some reason for it, and I don't want to go too much into the whole uh, the, the speculation of it, but there's a fullness in this story, I think, that, that we need to understand that it's important that that detail, for some reason, Jesus, uh, or that Luke wanted to be sure we got it in the story that he was to follow a man who was carrying water. Couldn't have been a hundred men carrying water. Couldn't have been two or three men carrying water. They must have known that there was something specific about this man carrying the water. So they they go to the house and then they begin to prepare the Passover with his disciples in the large upper room that had been furnished. It was ready. They, he was prepared for them at that time. Now uh, let's begin with reading from verse 14 when we see the institution then of the Lord's Supper. When the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Notice, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover. This is a particularly significant Passover before he suffers, he says. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you. It is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. Um, 
again, I was reading some background on this, and uh, if you know, there's this picture of the, the Last Supper with all the disciples sitting around the table. We don't know what the order is. However, in the conversation, if you go to the book of John and you read the conversation that's going on, um, Jesus begins to talk and to um, his disciples. John, of course, was the beloved one. So he was close, and we know that uh, he was able to place his head on Jesus' uh, chest and an and, and, and expression of his love. But we know that it was Peter who had to ask John then to ask Jesus a question. So it was probably Peter that was next to John who was next to Jesus. Interesting to note, though, that when Jesus said about Judas who was going to uh, uh, betray him, he said, he's the person in whom I dip this morsel of bread and I put it on his, uh, give on his plate or on his on portion to give it to him. So many commentators believe that Judas was on one side and John was on the other side, and that Jesus knew that Judas was to betray him, and that Jesus, in his grace, was trying to bring Judas back close to him so that he might, he might show his love and his mercy to this one whom he knew was going to betray him. And, and it's interesting, too, that Jesus was careful not to identify Judas openly. We see what was going on, but, we, but the disciples really didn't know what was happening that night. They didn't know that Judas was this one. Otherwise, I, I'm, I'm fairly confident, knowing how, how uh, impetuous Peter is, that if he had known that Judas had betrayed his master Jesus, man, he'd have been on it in no time. And John would have been right next. Judas would have never made it out of the room. I'm quite confident of that. Because they had, all, they had all of them sworn their allegiance to Jesus. Wasn't it Peter who said that, hey, I'm ready to die for him? And if Judas had been identified, then <laughs> he would have been toast in no time. And, and so Jesus, in his mercy, then reveals Judas as, been, as the one Who's going to be, who's going to betray him, so that Judas fully know, fully understands that Jesus knows, and yet allows him out of the room to go about his business of betraying Jesus without allowing the disciples to know. I find that really just an, an, an incredible um, illustration of the grace of Jesus Christ. How 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 different he reacts to situations than we do. You know, even when you when you think about Jesus and the crowd of people who were coming in and they're shouting great hosannas, and yet Jesus is weeping because he knows what's to come. And here it is, his, his close disciple whom, you, you remember, he prayed all night for those disciples. And Judas was chosen one of them. And Judas was given a position of importance, holding the, holding the money and being in charge of, the, uh, of all the finances. And now uh, it breaks Jesus' heart that Judas has turned on him and betrayed him. And he, he shows this expression of love even in the midst of the betrayal. <clears throat> and so I'll ask the ushers if you'll come and prepare our Lord's Supper here. And uh, we'll take it as uh, in remembering the context in which then uh, this first Lord's Supper was taken. They've, they've come and celebrated the Passover. The Passover has been prepared for them. This is after the Passover has been celebrated. Now they come to this communion time. Uh, the reason that, that this is so important is because we, there's, there's a huge change that's taking place here. This, the Passover that they celebrated had always been a Jewish celebration. Always been a Jewish celebration. To this day, it's a celebration distinctive to the Jews in celebrating what they're hoping is the coming, the coming of uh, the Messiah. The reason that this is so important is because Jesus said, this is the last Passover until we meet together in the kingdom. Now, I believe that Jews, even Christian Jews, Messianic Jews, will still partake in the Passover, and even sometimes Christians do. It's a very meaningful celebration. But there's no record in the Bible at all of Gentiles 
ever participating in a Passover celebration. This, what we're doing tonight, is uniquely prepared for the body of Christ, the believers of Jesus Christ to partake. And this is the very first time in which Jesus is introducing this to them. And soon, then, what's going to happen as far as the body of Christ is concerned, the practice of the Passover is going to fade, and then it'll be surrounding around this particular celebration, which we call this the communion and the Last Supper. And he, he, he very specifically says that the bread is a picture of my broken body, giving a picture of the fact of his suffering and his passion on the cross. Then he speaks about the blood, the blood that's going to be shed as, as a token of the new covenant, the new testament, the new uh, relationship between his bl- between him and his followers. Because we'll see at the crucifixion that the Holy of Holies is opened up and we can enter into it through the blood of Jesus Christ. So this is a very, very important celebration which we do tonight. This is a celebration that is specifically designed for the body of Christ. For those who have become, and, and really, there are some churches who, if you're not a member, a bona fide member of that particular local congregation, you cannot participate. It's called closed communion. And, and uh, I, I don't argue with them because there's, there's good reason for it. There are others then who consider communion a time of close fellowship, in which when we come together of like faith and like practice, together as the body of Christ, we invite others who share with us in, in the belief of the blood uh, of the of the salvation of Jesus, salvation uh, through Jesus Christ and His shed blood, that we can come together and gather uh, around this table and fellowship, and that's what we're going to do tonight. So, uh, let's just take a, a moment, and uh, while the ushers get ready then to prepare, them, let's just take a moment of, of quiet prayer, silence, and uh, we won't have any music because you know they didn't have any music at the, in the at, at the time when. Uh, his disciples were gathering around this time. And so we'll just be quiet for a few minutes and prepare our hearts to take this Lord's table. Father, it's a very special occasion. We need to take a moment and just pause and reflect on our own lives, our relationship with our brothers and sisters around us, our relationship with other people, and to be sure that our our uh, relationships are pure and uh, above reproach. I also ask the Lord Jesus that we would look closely at how we're walking with you. Are we walking in closeness and in simplicity? And in purity, I pray that there's nothing that comes between us, no sin. Lord, and if there be some sin between us, that we can take this time to confess it. Because your Bible says if we confess our sin because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you're faithful, just to cleanse us to, uh, from all unrighteousness and all sin. So I pray that we can just
So on the night which Jesus was betrayed, they took bread and broke it. It was a picture of the broken body of Jesus Christ. And so this night as we take this, let's do this in remembrance of Jesus, shall we? Then Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, the new testament. And it was written in his own blood. Shall we take this as the significance of his, our salvation? Our Father, the Bible says that uh, after they took of this very simple uh, ceremony, they prayed, they sang a song. And then they went out into the darkness. So I pray now, Lord Jesus, as we walk with you a ways over to the Garden of Gethsemane, that you might lead, guide, and direct our thoughts. I pray in Jesus' name. We'll go ahead and pass the post to us. Put it on the white cups. I want to um, take the story a little bit further here because. After they had completed this uh, very significant ceremony, and, and, and by the way, uh, let, me just, let me just point something out here. We, we find the significance of an event in its context. About mm, several thousands of years ago, the, a Jewish person would wake up in the morning might be a bright morning, but uh, they, were under, they were under great pressure because they were slaves of the Egyptians in building their empire. And even though <clears throat> they were called the people of God, there was this deep yearning in their heart and life that they might be able to be set free again. For 400 years, they've been captive and slaves. Life's getting worse and worse. It's a, it's a helpless and a hopeless situation. They have no opportunity and no uh, thought that they might be able to free themselves or slaves unless someone comes from the outside, unless God is to intervene. There's no hope for them as far as their future is concerned. So then into that scene walks a guy named Moses. Moses offers them, if they will trust him, that he will deliver them from Pharaoh. Well, you know the story, how it goes along. And they didn't trust him at first. So finally, <coughs> through the signs that he was able to do, he was to uh, build their confidence in him. And the last thing was this. He says there's going to be a 
ceremony that you need to celebrate with your family in your home in which an innocent lamb is going to be killed. And the, lamb of, and the blood of that lamb is to be put on the door posts and the lintel. And when the angel of death passes over, then the eldest in each family will, uh, who, where, there is not, where there is not this blood, then will be killed. That was called, that was the instigation of the Passover. Thousands of years later, we don't know how many thousands, a long time ago, the Jews once again find themselves chafing underneath another power. This is the Roman power. And they have tried it earlier before the New Testament times. It was called the Maccabean period where they had tried to rebel. They had tried to overthrow the Romans. It wasn't happening. Then we find that later on, their government is, is uh, they're trying to make amends with the Romans so that they can rule themselves. And so now, here comes another character onto the scene, and his name is Jesus. Jesus then goes to John to be baptized by him. John is this prophet who is prophesying about the, the, the uh, telling the people they need to repent of their sins and to be, uh, to be baptized and and Jesus comes and is baptized by John and that begins his ministry. Who, who is this guy? And that's the question everybody was asking. Who is this guy? And he promises them that he's going to be their Savior, that he's going to be their Messiah. And he comes as a picture of the king and, and with the promise of establishing the kingdom of David. And as we saw, as Jesus made this procession into Jerusalem, he had drawn a large gathering around him. And so... This large gathering had all hope that he was going to be established as king. He would overthrow the Roman government. Once again, Jerusalem would be their own people again. They'd have their own kingdom. And it didn't happen. So now Jesus is instituting this new uh, ceremony called the communion, the Lord's Supper. Something that we are to do until the time that he comes again to establish his kingdom or he takes us home to be with him. Uh, the reason that that's significant is because as we look down through history, we see how all these things are brought together to where Jesus is sitting at this table with these 12 disciples who are once again going to be head over their, their, um, their <coughs> tribes and, and in, the, in the kingdom. Uh, for us, it's significant because it's given to us as a body of Christ, believers in Jesus Christ. I began to think about that in, in this. In each of you have your story of how you got to Taiwan, right? Or each of you have your story of how you got here today. Each of you have your story of how you've brought, been brought together in this community here. And, and the reason I was thinking about this is because yesterday I had the opportunity to give my testimony again of why I'm in Taiwan and why I'm in Tianmu and why we're at this at this church, and it just struck me that as we gather here tonight, all of us have our stories, and it's, the significance is in our stories in bringing us here to this time. And the significance is for Jesus, and, and Luke telling us this story, is telling us how Jesus then is taking his journey to the cross and how it's going to ful be fulfilled in our salvation. So he takes his disciples. They go across to the Mount uh, of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, and there is a place where Jesus was accustomed to going. He left his, most of his disciples, except for Peter, James, and John, uh, at the, at, an early place in the garden. And they began to walk a bit further. And then Jesus told his disciples that he was in great passion, that he was in great turmoil. And he told his disciples, three of them, Peter, James, and John, his three closest uh, friends on earth. And he said, you wait for me here and pray with me while I go and uh, I pray. He, he, he told them that there was this, this great burden upon him. And uh, so he went away to pray. And <clears throat> what I'd like for us to do is this. We don't pray very much as a church, at least not corporately. And um, so I'd like for us to just take some time to, to pray. We, we don't, uh, I, I don't know if we want to share some of the things that Jesus had on, like Jesus had on his heart. It was pretty deep. He's looking at death. I don't know that any of us are looking at death. Actually, we don't even know, do we? But let's take for a moment. Just, just stop where we are for a moment. 
And let's just close our eyes and you begin to think about some of the things that are very dear and very important. Maybe it's someone in your family. Maybe it's someone who you know who has uh, once been in the faith and has, has left and walked away. Maybe it's someone that you know dearly who you would love to, to be drawn into the faith. Maybe it's a very deep personal problem that you're facing, uh, an issue in your family, an issue at your place of work. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's whatever God, uh, God's trying to speak to you and you, you, you want to know what, what God's desire is in your life. Maybe it's, this, it's, it's making this commitment to step in with both feet and say, I'm going to serve God with everything I have. Everyone has this difficult decision it has to make of commitment. So let's just close our eyes for a moment and, and pray silently. As, as if we were in the garden and as if we're facing a very difficult situation. Lord Jesus, it's very hard for us in this situation, in this context, to come anywhere close to what you are facing. But even in, in the quietness, you know, it's oftentimes when we come to worship you, there's just a lot of things going on. It's very rare that we spend time in quietness together like this. And it's important to realize that as you were alone that night, the deep sense of your coming crucifixion, how that was going to happen, and how you begged your father and saying, if there's some other way, let's do it another way. Yet in your heart, you, you willingly said, nevertheless, Oh, Father, it's not my will, but yours be done. And to think that Jesus and all his humanity struggled with, with that, not my will, but thine be done. And, and how you agonized, not so much the physical aspect, but the spiritual aspect of taking on the sin of the world, my sin, and how you agonized over what that sin was going to do to break the relationship that had never been broken between you and the Father, and how you agonized that night as you knelt there in prayer. Lord, would that we would agonize over sin. Would that we would come to the place where regardless of what uh, difficulty it's going to be that we would say, not my will, but yours be done. Would that we would understand what it means to be dead to self and alive to Jesus. Maybe we need to, in the quietness of our home, to simply get alone with you, God, and to agonize over not my will. Not my will, but yours be done. There was a great victory won in that garden that night. Father, thank you for giving Jesus strength and sustenance that he was able to overcome, that he took the remaining steps to the cross, and there suffered and died for our sin. Thank you, Lord Jesus. May we somehow, some way, Enter in to what you were going through that night. I pray these things in your name. So Jesus and his disciples were praying there. and They heard the noise of 
of those who were coming, uh, the guards that were coming with Judas, because he knew where Je he was the only one of them who would have known where Jesus was. Brought them right where his place is, and, the, and there was a confrontation. They arrested Jesus. They took him away, went to the trial. At the trial, Peter denied it. Peter denied it. Um, you know, again, here's something that the Bible doesn't go through. It doesn't open up the emotions that are going, that are there. It just tells these things matter of fact. Peter denied Jesus. And yes, yes, he wept, but we don't know what's going through Jesus' heart. As he actually sees what's going on, we're, we're told that Peter's eyes and Jesus' eyes met. They came into contact, and it must have just crushed. It must have just crushed. Because he was the one who so boldly said, I'll, I'll die for you. And yet Jesus warned him, tonight, you're going to deny me. I, how difficult that was. Then they took Jesus, and before Pilate, before Pilate, he was falsely accused. Pilate asked the Jews, would you rather have Jesus released or Barabbas? And here it is. This is the crux. They, they absolutely denied anything to do with the king that had come, the kingdom that had come, where they said, we would rather have a thief rather than this one called Jesus. So Jesus is taken out. His, his, uh, his clothes are stripped from him. He's taken and whipped until his back is literally laying in ribbons down his uh, legs and uh, weakened from, from uh, loss of blood the night before and loss of sleep. Then he put this heavy cross on Jesus, and he carries it down the dusty lanes of Jerusalem until he can go no further. There in, the, in all the dust and the dirt of a, of a, of a village-type street, Jesus falls to the ground, and he can't get up, and he can't carry his cross anymore. I, I really do like the story about Simon of Cyrene, who was in the crowd and was chosen to carry the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, I, it, or... I, I've oftentimes tried to imagine what it would have been like to have been Simon on that night and said, hey, buddy, you're the one. To have stepped out and to pick up the cross of a criminal. To step out and to pick up the cross of the criminal, you're taking on his burden uh, and, and carrying it the rest of the way. That's when Jesus says we have this opportunity to pick up our cross and to carry it. That's, that's what he's talking about. We can step to where he's at, pick up the cross, and carry it up to up the mountain. When they bring it up to the mountain, to the top of Mount Calvary, uh, then the, they put out the cross beam, take Jesus' hands, and they take these large spikes and drive them through the bottom of the palm right here, still considered, still considered the hand, and, uh, in order that uh, they can hold him there to the cross. Medical science tells us there's a median nerve that goes up and down the arm here. That, that median nerve is damaged. It literally sends uh, uh, burning flames of pain rushing to a person's head. So as Jesus is on that cross and hanging there with his feet together, in order for him to breathe, he has to pull up to take a breath in. He pulls up, and the, 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 just these shearing flashes of pain come through his mind there and, and through his brain and, and racks his body. And then he can take a breath, but he can't let it out except by forcing out in speech. Because the, such, there's such pressure here on the, the chest and the esophagus area, every time Jesus wants to say something or to take breath in or let it out, he's got to pull up just a bit or, or push up on his feet. But as the body begins to weaken and deteriorate, then the, the different joints come out of place, leaving it impossible then for the person to, to be able to pull themselves up. And this goes on for a period of several hours. It's an excruciatingly wicked way for a person to have to die. And, and I don't know that, I, I honestly don't think that we can understand uh, what it would be like. And... Uh, the, the crowds are jeering. The crowds are laughing. They're saying, you're the Messiah. Why don't you come down? But, folks, we should be very glad that Jesus didn't come down from that cross, that he went all the way, and all the way to the point where the Bible tells us that he took all the sin of the world on him. 
And suddenly, Jesus' world turned to Because he heard the word, he, he sensed his father turned his back on him, and he cries out, my God, my God, why had you forsaken me? Notice, Jesus did not address him as father. The father relationship had been broken. The only time in all of eternity in which the Trinity, for a moment, was broken. That's hard to understand. That's hard for us to grasp. There was such a unity in the Trinity between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Listen, folks, the only damage ever done to the Trinity was your sin and mine. Your sin and mine. And for that damage, we deserve to be forever separated from God. We are the ones who ruined the relationship between the Father and the Son. We deserve to be forever damned and forever separated from God for that. For that. And yet he takes it on himself so that you and I can have that relationship. As Jesus takes his dying breath in the Holy of Holies, the curtain is, is torn from the top to the bottom. And so the Holy of Holies is open then for all to enter. What an amazing thought. But as we were stand, as we are standing there, if we were one of the disciples, we would have been there and seen when the body went completely dead. We would have heard the last expiration of breath. It, there's something, I, I don't mean to be crude, but there's something about a dead body that is just frightening, completely lifeless. As a pastor, my first experience was with a 24-year-old 24 24 young man. His, he had uh, um, a fast-acting cancer. And I was in the hospital room when he took his last breath. I, it, was, it was absolutely shocking to me. I've never experienced you know, there's something that's so fine. There's something that's so uh, intensely ending about death. When you, when, when, when you speak about death and you speak about gone, it's forever gone. It's, it's over. There's no turning back. And it leaves such an incredible emptiness there, a void, and where life has been taken and sucked right out, and it's not there anymore. And so on that night, or on that day, those disciples who stood and they watched their king as he died on the cross and took his last breath, they were there as they took him down off the cross and tried to make some sense out of, it, out of his body that had been just so poured. They wrapped him up in these spices and quickly placed him in a tomb and shut the, the tomb in preparation for uh, the Sabbath day. You ever been to a funeral where they close the casket? It's done. You ever been to a funeral where they take the casket in and they put it into the grave and begin to fill it in? It's finished. There's a finality to it. There's an end to it. It's done. It's over. It's never going to be the same. It's never coming back again. It'll never be the same. And so the disciples, having they, 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 they're, they're going through these final acts of closing things up, of putting the body within the grave and shutting the, the grave up. And, and, of course, there's this hope that after the Passover, they might come over and they might finish the burial process. They were so rushed, they couldn't give Jesus a proper burial. And they were thinking they might be able to come back, but it comes a Jewish Sabbath, and, and, and they had to close it up. They had to wait. And, and as they waited there, what do you think is going through their mind? Everything that they had heard, what's it mean anymore? It's done. It's finished. I ask you this question. I ask you this question. I ask you to reflect on it for just a moment. What if Jesus was dead? What if Jesus was still in 
the grave. What hope would we have? And so what I would like to ask you to do is this. I, I don't think it's going to be easy. But I just ask you to do this. Tonight, tomorrow, and Saturday. Remind yourself what it would be like to be a disciple. Jesus is dead. Jesus is dead. All the hopes, the aspirations, the promises, all the things that he did, he's dead. It's gone. It's finished. It's over. Then comes Sunday. But I, I challenge you to do this for the next next few days, next few hours. To live, well, don't live as if it's dead. It might be too wicked. But just to think about it, reflect on it. Tomorrow morning, if it's your habit to get up and pray and read your Bible, don't. Jesus is dead. Reflect on that. Just try it. See what, that, what it's like. Because Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming, and please don't miss Sunday, right? Life's pretty awful. I'd like to close this evening with a, an old, old hymn, the old rugged cross. And uh, let's have a word of prayer, shall we? As I'm praying that the band can, can come on up, and we'll sing this song as a, as a closing uh, song for us, the old rugged cross. And I just want, I, I purposely don't want to, uh, I, I purposely want us to think about dead Jesus, what it would be like, what it's like to, to the few first few days after a funeral, to live in that, in that way. Our Father, uh, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm praying, I'm talking to you. The only reason that I'm praying and talking to you is because of what Jesus did on the cross. You opened up the way for us. But we're, we're going to try something, Lord, and, and I think it would be very difficult for us, and that's a good thing. But if we would just, for the next few hours, think about what it was like to be a disciple and everything they had hoped for, everything they had aspired to, they had, they had conversations about who was going to be first in the kingdom. They had conversations, even at the Passover table, about who was greatest amongst them. They had made promises to you they were looking forward to your establishing this king here and now. And bam, gone. It's gone. Lord, in the next few hours, let us think about that. When we go to bed tonight, what would it be like to be a disciple going to sleep that night knowing Jesus is dead? What, it would, what would it be like the next morning to wake up and realize? Jesus is gone. The king is no longer. Our Messiah is not here. It's not what we thought it was. Help us to enter in a bit to the loneliness and the desperation. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Good cross, the emblem of suffering.
Exchange.